In today's lecture, we're talking about the genus Mycoplasma. These are the smallest self-replicating prokaryotes, and like some of the other organisms we've talked about, they've undergone this process of genome reduction, and some have become increasingly dependent on their hosts. As some of our smallest self-replicating prokaryotes, these organisms are anatomically a little bit weird. They lack a peptidoglycan-composed cell wall, and they therefore don't stain with the gram stain, and are intrinsically resistant to the beta-lactam type antimicrobials. Although we have a wide variety of mycoplasma of importance to both human and veterinary medicine, the first species to be described was actually Mycoplasma mycoides, which causes a very important and potentially economically damaging disease in cattle that we'll talk about later in the lecture. Because these organisms don't have a cell wall, they sort of lack that structural rigidity, and the cells are oftentimes irregularly shaped. They can be round, pear-shaped, or even kind of filamentous. I mentioned at the outset that some mycoplasma have undergone a process of genome reduction, and there's examples where we have genomes as small as 540,000 base pairs, which is super, super tiny. So for comparison, staphylococci have around 2 million base pairs, 2.5 million base pairs, and E. coli have 4 megabase pair genomes. So 540,000 is really, really small. Among the mycoplasma that we are able to grow in vitro, um, they require specialized media. It needs to be extra nutritious. Um, they require precursors for nucleic acid and protein synthesis, as well as lipid biosynthesis. Remember, genome reduction means they lack a lot of the metabolic machinery to do things kind of on their own. When we look at colonies of mycoplasma, they oftentimes have this fried egg type appearance, which you can see over here in the right. This is a mycoplasma bovis culture. Some species can be quite slow growing and take multiple days in order to get a culture. And if we look at the containment requirements for mycoplasma, uh, mycoplasma bovis, hemophilus, and, and other hematrophic mycoplasmas are all biocontainment level two, while mycoplasma mycoides and capricolum are biocontainment level three. These would be very, very serious foreign animal diseases if ever introduced into Canada. Mycoplasmas are host-associated. Um, they're found on the mucous membranes, the upper respiratory tract, the genital tract, and the intestinal tract. And for our hemotrophic species, we find them in the blood. Subclinical carriage is a real challenge. So we have many animals who are not displaying any signs of disease that potentially have the organisms. And while they are primarily host-associated, um, they can survive for short periods of time in protected environments. If we look at the taxonomy of mycoplasma, there are 50 species. Um, within the genus now, we have the formally described Hemobartonella and Epirethrozoan. Um, these are now included within mycoplasma. So we've had sort of a, a, a consolidation of genera. This consolidation has happened as we've gained new techniques and been able to better evaluate the relatedness of these organisms. So whether it's by MALDI or microscopy, which is what was historically done, and now that we're in the molecular age, we can much more easily tell organisms apart or perhaps lump them together. I think it's really useful to divide mycoplasma species into those which are hematrophic, um, our bloodborne mycoplasmas that cannot be grown on agar plates, from our non hematrophic species, which can be grown on agar plates. Mycoplasmas produce a variety of virulence factors, variable surface proteins that allow them to evade. Uh, antibodies in the immune system, adhesins, which are oftentimes species-specific and allow them to adhere to host tissues, lipoproteins involved in both adhesion and stimulating the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, capsules, which allow for persistence and dissemination, so maybe that short amount of survival time in the environment is really facilitated by the capsule, and then biofilm. Some species can do this, but what's really interesting about them is that they lack the classical biofilm-associated genes that we see in other bacteria. With respect to clinical significance, uh, mycoplasma mycoides is a cause of contagious bovine pleuropneumonia in cattle, and mycoplasma capricolum causes a similar disease but in goats, both really important foreign animal diseases. 
Mycoplasma bovis causes a wide variety of clinical presentations in cattle, um, mastitis, arthritis, pneumonia, and abortion. Galliseptacum is associated with respiratory tract infections in chickens and really particularly turkeys. Ionomoniae is associated with enzootic pneumonia in pigs. And mycoplasma felis causes sort of upper respiratory tract infections in cats, from conjunctivitis, rhinitis, down to potentially pneumonia. Then we have our hematrophic mycoplasma species. Uh, mycoplasma hemophilus is maybe uh, one of the best known um, in cats. This causes feline infectious anemia. But we have other species uh, of hematropic mycoplasma that can affect many different animals. There's a hemocanus, a hemolemma, etc. And they're all united by their association with infectious anemia. And then finally, for completeness sake, I wanted to mention mycoplasma pneumonia in people. This is not a hematrophic species, but it causes respiratory infections in us. We're going to start off talking about mycoplasma mycoides, so contagious bovine pleuropneumonia. Um, this is a very old disease. It was first described in mid-1500s and has been recognized for a really long time. Um, there have been major eradication efforts globally, which have been actually quite successful. Um, North America, we've been free of mycoplasma mycoides since the late 1800s. Australia, the last cases were in uh, the 1970s. And in Europe, it was finally eradicated from Portugal in 1999. Currently, the only recognized uh, endemic region is sub-Saharan Africa. This disease is notifiable to the OIE. And in Canada, if it was ever identified, control would be all about stamping out. So the CFIA classifies this as a Category 1 threat to terrestrial animals, and there would be no treatment. There would be uh, humane depopulation uh, of the animals and then decontamination of the premise. This link here will take you to the World Organization for Animal Health, which was formerly the OIE, and their website on contagious bovine pleuropneumonia. CBPP is characterized by severe fibrinous pneumonia. Um, it has a very high morbidity rate, so in affected herds, up to 70% of animals can be um, sick, and up to 50% of those who are sick can die. So not surprisingly, this results in major production losses. Um, in acute disease, we see high fever and severe respiratory distress. In subacute to chronic disease, um, we see animals which have typically recovered from the acute phase, but have sort of an ongoing persistent cough and progressive cachexia, so they're losing weight and kind of wasting. The incubation period is variable and can actually be quite long, so three weeks to six months, which makes control quite challenging in endemic regions, and transmission is through prolonged contact with carriers. In this image, you can see focal fibrinoseparative and necrotizing pneumonia, so this really, really um, pronounced lesion here on the, the lung lobe. And what's interesting about contagious bovine pleuropneumonia is that you get a classical marbling pathological lesion. So you can see this lung here on cut section. It has this very marbled appearance, kind of like would be expected in a, a very expensive, high-quality steak. On the right, um, what we can see is fibrin actually around the lung lobules. So maybe in here, there's a little bit of fibrin. Um, so pathological lesions that are, are really very, very characteristic and should absolutely raise red flags if ever you see these. In goats, mycoplasma capricolum causes contagious caprine pleuropneumonia. Um, just like in, in cattle with mycoplasma mycoides, this is associated with a high rate of morbidity, up to 100% and an even higher rate of mortality from 60 to 100% in affected herds. The disease is characterized by cough, hyperpnea, pyrexia, um, weakness, anorexia, nasal discharge, um, and it often progresses to open mouth breathing with frothy saliva. This organism is transmitted by aerosols, and they've been shown to travel up to 50 meters. So you don't need close contact between um, an infected and susceptible organism in order for disease to occur. This organism is found in Africa, the Middle East, and the Eastern Mediterranean region, as well as in Asia. And just like Mycoplasma mycoides, this is a foreign animal disease in Canada. On the right here, you can see a goat displaying open mouth breathing with frothy saliva, and this is occurring without tachypnea. So the, the goat isn't 
uh, breathing at an increased rate, and yet we have these clinical signs. This is apparently a, a classical presentation for contagious caprine pleuropneumonia. And then on the right, you can see fibrinous pleuropneumonia. So on the caudal aspects of the lung lobes, I think you can appreciate there's a lot of fibrin deposition, and you can even see strands of it um, in between the lobes. Mm -hmm.